you to welcome all of you here to our service this morning. Uh, of course, our members and visitors alike, if you are visiting with us this morning, we are glad that you're here. And we would also appreciate it if you would fill out one of the visitor's cards that you will find uh, in the uh, little rack in front of your seat. And you can just leave those on your seat and they will be collected after the service that we might have a record of your visit with us this morning. Uh, for those of you who are worshiping with us remotely this morning, we are glad that you are able to join us also. After this service, we will meet for Bible classes. We have Bible classes for all ages. Those start at 1015 and will be over at uh, 11 o'clock. If you did not receive a communion uh, packet, would you please raise your hand that we might have one of our ushers uh, bring you that I'm going to start with some cards I was given this morning because if I don't start with these, uh, I'm liable to forget them. First of all, thank you, for, uh, thank you all for the cards, prayers, and donation to the youth group in memory of my sister-in-law, Janice Rowland, and Christian love, Herb Rowland. Your thoughts, prayers, <clears throat> plant, and the delicious food brought to the funeral home were very much appreciated during the loss of my mother, Janie Barnes. Your kind words meant so much to us. Thank you. Of Jamie and Heath Griffith and this one from Maggie Hurst dear church family thank you for all the cards and calls concerning the passing of my brother Gary Campbell Gary was on our sick list for uh, off and on for many years uh, he lived in Knoxville and he passed away she said thank you also for the donation for the youth group in his memory in in Christ Maggie Hurst I hope you brought your very, very longest attention span with you this morning because we have a long list of announcements. I told Tony that his sermon is going to have to be cut down to about 15 minutes. He said no class will be cut down to about 15 minutes. So we'll begin with the uh, sick list. Uh,
song will be number 756 756 
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we have these opportunities such as this to come together as Christians, to worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray, Father, that as we do so, that we would put the worldly thoughts and things out of our minds and concentrate on your word. I pray, Father, that we would edify each other and ourselves and strive to make ourselves better Christians and follow your word as best we can. Father, we're mindful of those who are not able to be with us this morning because of reasons beyond their control, whether they be sick in home or the hospital or nursing homes or whatever their case may be. We pray, Father, that if it's your will that their situation might improve, that they would be able to return back with us soon. We're thankful for those that have been sick and been able to return back with us as it was announced earlier. Pray, Father, for those that's lost loved ones. Pray that they would look to thee for guidance and that your word would give them strength and comfort. Pray that we would do what we can as Christians and fellow brethren to help those through those times of need. Father, we're mindful of those around the world who are not Christians and pray that we would do as you have commanded us to, to strive to spread your word. We would always look for opportunities to spread your word and teach your word to those that we come in contact with here locally as well as as far and as broad as we can reach. Pray, Father, that we would never be ashamed of your word, and we would always stand boldly and proudly to proclaim your word to anybody that comes around that we have that opportunity to do so. Father, we pray that you would be with us through this service. Pray that you would be with us through our classes in a few moments. Pray that, again, that we would concentrate on your word and edify each one. Pray that you please forgive us of our sins as we go through this life. We would always strive to serve you in a way that would be pleasing. And at the end of this life, you might give us a home that you had prepared for us in heaven. Please forgive us of our sins. We ask this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. For the invitation song this morning, we'll use number 744. 744. We'll sing that following the lesson. And now as we prepare our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 764, 764. <clears throat> when we meet
this time in our worship service this morning, we do set aside this time to partake of the Lord's Supper together as a congregation and to help prepare our minds for the Lord for, for partaking of the Lord's Supper. I'd like to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 28. If you'd like to follow along with me there as we read from there as Paul helps the Corinthians to understand the purpose of partaking and the meaning of partaking of the Lord's Supper. So once again, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 24 through 28. And when, we, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Father, we chart in heaven as we set aside this time to partake of the Lord's Supper. We are mindful of your son's sacrifice on the cruel cross at Calvary. And Father, we thank you for his sacrifice so that it provides for us the opportunity through through obedience to your word to be able to one day inherit that home in heaven. Father, this morning, as we are about to partake of this bread, we pray that our minds will be thoughtful upon his body nailed to that cross at Calvary. We pray, Father, that as we do so, that all other things will be set aside from our minds, that you will find our minds clear, and that you will help flood our memories and flood our minds with the thoughts and the memorial of him and his sacrifice for us. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. ask you now to bow with me one more time. Again, Father, we humbly come before you and, and again thank you for your son's sacrifice for us. Father, this morning as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we pray, Father, that we'll do so in a manner that's worthy to thy name, that we'll be mindful of your son's blood shed for us on the cross so that we may have the opportunity for remission of sins. Pray that you'll be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 36. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. This Tuesday evening, the brethren at the New Hope Congregation have invited me to speak on their vacation Bible school. And several months ago, they asked me if I would speak on the topic of endurance 
with the theme of the series being on the Olympics, being able to use those as an opportunity. On Wednesday evening, Brother Jared decided to use my topic uh, for the devotional, but he did a great job with it. And I'm going to try to be able to use some of that same idea as we approach our lesson this morning. I thought it would be very good to talk about the background of this and to be able to apply some of this to our scriptural understanding. You see, in 2020 were to be the Olympics that are held every four years. But due to the COVID virus, this was rescheduled for this year. And next month, in the month of July, we'll begin the annual or the um, every four-year Olympics and that will be conducted in Japan. Many people are getting excited about it. There are people who want to watch almost every detail of it. Many people do not realize, though, that you can go back and look at the history of it and realize that it affected a lot of the writing that we have in the New Testament, particularly 1 Corinthians. And you read and study chapter 9, and you see Paul alluding to those games in that passage. Or you can go to Hebrews chapters 12 and uh, other portions of that book, and you can find the reference to it. Many of us may not always appreciate the origin and the beginning of these games and how they have some impact of lessons for us today. For instance, the games did not begin in Athens. That's where we tend to think of the Olympics, but it actually began in Olympia, which is far west from Athens. In fact, it's even west from Corinth. And it was the, uh, conducted for several different reasons. The first one was a religious one. It was attached to the worship of Zeus. If you go to the ruins of Olympia, you will notice the, the grand uh, area there where the races were conducted. But right next to it was a temple built to Zeus. And Phidias had built this huge statue to Zeus place there and there was a connection of you come and participated in the games and while you were there you gave some honor some recognition some devotion if you will to Zeus and so there was a religious aspect of it but another reason why it was created was to unite the Greek people when we think of this country of Greece today, we likely think of the city of Athens because it's the largest city. But you have to remember there were several other cities in Greece that also were very important, uh, particularly Olympia, Corinth, and others. And there was an attempt to try to unite the Greek-speaking people so that they would be as one. And if you think about the Olympics today, the brotherhood of man, the fact that People from all nations come together and there's a unifying aspect of it. However, there was a third reason why they had the Olympics and it was to prepare the young men for war. Whether it was the races, the throwing of the javelins, all of these games were for the very purpose of trying to get people prepared to enter into battle. I got to thinking, as you think about us today, there should be a sense in which as we think about our service to God pictured as a game, there's a religious aspect to it, but we worship the one true and living God. There's a unifying aspect that we're a part of the same team, that we're all working together to accomplish the same purpose and it does prepare us to do battle with the devil. Well, here's what we're going to do as we talk about endurance. It's just one aspect of this. We're going to talk about endurance begins with preparation. And then endurance continues with performance. What we do, how we act. And then number three, <laughs> endurance concludes with the prize. Now let's take just a few minutes to talk about endurance begins with preparation. 
failure to practice and prepare is destined to fail in any venture of life. You say, I want to be an accountant. Well, you better prepare yourself by learning math. You say, I want to be able to do uh, this or that. Preparation is essential to it. Now, if you're thinking about a person who is preparing to enter these Olympic Games, the Bible will make reference to those who are going through strength conditioning. In fact, Hebrews chapter 12 will mention the weights. Or you will think about the strategy how to be able to confront the obstacles that are in front of you. To think about, for instance, a person who's going to enter a race about the pacing that they would go about to know, can I finish this race? Let me take your attention for just a few minutes to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I'm just going to look at verses 24 through 27. And let's look and see what Paul writes to the Corinthians. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may be able to obtain it. And everyone who competes is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus. Not with uncertainty. Thus I fight. Not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now for just a moment, pause here and view what he's saying. He said in verse 24, run in such a way that you may obtain it. He's talking about a person putting the effort out, the motivation, the desire, I want to be able to win this race. Verse 25, everyone who competes, competes for the prize is temperate. The word temperate means self-controlled. Everyone who's going to win is going to have to go through this th evaluation of themselves, what I eat, the way I exercise, the way I prepare my mind. After services Wednesday evening, we were talking Brother Mike, who has run marathons and several other races. And he talks about having to prepare, run, so that when you get to the time that you need to, you know what you can do and you've prepared yourself for it. But notice verse 26. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. I never really had thought about that phrase much until preparing for this lesson. I don't run with uncertainty. He knows the route he's going to take. He knows the obstacles that are going to be in the way. He knows what he has planned to do to overcome those obstacles. And then I'm beginning to think the importance of that kind of preparation for a Christian how that you and I should be anticipating the difficulties, the challenges that we're going to face and how we're going to meet those challenges. A second thing that one must do to prepare is to learn the rules. You know, there's a lot of rules in various sports that we have, and if a person doesn't know the rules, next thing you know, they're going to be, for instance, uh, if you're a lineman, you say ineligible, a uh, receiver down the field. Somebody wasn't supposed to be there where they're uh, throwing the ball. And you realize that a person has to, to study the rules. Well, in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 5, Paul writes, And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. You've got to follow the rules that are given now, if you're playing football, there's a group of rules that are written for college football, for professional football. If you're thinking about playing baseball, there are rules for baseball and every other sport. If you and I think about running the race of life, there are rules that God has set forth for us. Now, interestingly, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8, he says... 
But we know the law is good if one uses it lawfully. A person has to take the rules and make sure that you follow the intent of those rules. Paul had to deal with people who had questioned him. And you get to Romans chapters 5 and 6 and they're going through this idea, well, if God's grace forgives all, then maybe I'll just sin all I want to, so God's grace will be more. And he says in chapter 6 and verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Literally, may it never be so. God forbid. We must not break the rules and break the intent of the rules. But every Christian must prepare himself to be a faithful child of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 and 21 he talks about in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. And then I get to verse 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor. And then carefully, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Part of my preparation to be a faithful Christian is to make sure that I am useful for the Lord. In Psalm 119, verse 11, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You and I need to memorize the rules. We need to memorize what God expects from us so that when we encounter challenges and obstacles, we are ready to meet them. And then the book of Ephesians chapter 6. He talks about the soldier being prepared for battle. And he said in verse 10. Finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. You know, if I'm going to serve in the Lord's army and I'm preparing myself, I've got to make sure I'm prepared for the battle. And so what he tells us to do Stand therefore having your waist girded with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Yes, you prepare yourself by being properly adorned as a soldier. And then Luke chapter 12, verses 42 through verse 48. I don't have time to go into great detail here. It's pictured here as a master goes away. He leaves a servant in charge. And when you get specifically to verse 47, and that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself to do according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. I need to be the kind of person who says, I want to endure the race of the Christian life, but I've got to prepare myself to do it and to do it properly. Well, then endurance continues with performance. You think about the, all the preparation that takes place as this person or that person prepares for their day of the Olympics. And the race is ready to start. And in order to perform properly, you have to have discipline and determination. All that preparation that you have done has got to now be focused, disciplined. But now you have to have your mindset as well. I will do this. I will accomplish it. I will face these challenges. And what that involves is taking off anything that hinders you. I remember as a child that when it came time to run, many of us had to wear boots to school. I don't know about you, but 
Uh, boots were very popular when I was an elementary student. And it came time you're going to have to run a race. You know what we always did? Went, sat down, and we took our boots off. The reason why you took them off so you could be able to run. Well, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Every weight, everything that's going to slow you down, that's going to hinder you in running the race. I think it's obvious as you read this here, he says, and the sin which so easily ensnares or so easily besets us, that's that sin that's really particularly difficult for us to deal with individually. He said, you've got to take that off. You have to be able to run this race with endurance, putting all your effort into it. The second thing that you do is you look at the leader. Here's someone else who's already run his leg of the race, if you will, and has already finished. He continues on by saying, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You look at the Lord. He's already made a full leg on that race. He is the author. That is, he's the one who designed the race. He's the finisher. He's the one who tells you about where the race ends. He said, you look to him, and what do you see? You see one who endured the cross, the difficulty that was placed before him. He despised the shame. He didn't enjoy what he had to endure, but he knew what he was working for. The joy that was set before him, he endured that cross. 1 Peter 2, 21 says, Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example. Now, there will be problems and pain along the way. And we ought to expect it. We ought to expect that there will be difficulties sometimes starting the race. There will be some difficulties sometimes during the race. There will be difficulties finishing the race. You know, I like to use examples that sometimes are very positive. And prior to living here, we lived in Clarksville, Tennessee for seven years. And there's a very famous lady from Clarksville, Tennessee. Her name was Wilma Rudolph. Miss Rudolph was born in 1940 in St. Bethlehem, which is a little small suburb of Clarksville, much like Westwood is to McMinnville. It's just... It's attached to the city now. You, you can't even tell when you leave St. Bethlehem when you come into the proper city of Clarkson. But Miss Rudolph was born as a premature child. She had a number of childhood illnesses. She suffered from pneumonia. She got scarlet fever. But when she was five years old, the virus polio hit her. She had to wear braces and orthopedic shoes. She made weekly trips to Meharry Medical College or the hospital in Nashville for them to treat her. Her parents had to provide uh, a lot of help for her. And by the way, she was child number 12 of 22. Child number 12 of 22. But Miss Rudolph, by the time she got to be 12 years old, was able to take the braces off. By the time she was 16, she was the star of her basketball team and the track team. And she tried out for the Olympics and made it. In 1960, when she was 20 years old, she ran the Olympics and was the first woman to win three gold medals in the Olympian. She was called the fastest woman alive. I think about all the difficulties Miss Rudolph had to go through. You imagine being born premature, 
You imagine being 12 of 22, the attention you probably received. You think about all the childhood diseases. You think about that little girl having to walk around with those braces just to be able to walk. And then when she's 16, she runs in the Olympics. When she's 22, she wins three gold medals. Folks, I can tell you what, she had some difficulties, but she had some determination. She had to realize, if I want to succeed, I've got to do what I've got to do to win. Well, she came across the finish line and won those gold medals. I want you to think about 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Paul would write, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That means that any obstacle that is in life, there's always been someone else who's had to face a similar difficult circumstance like that. But God knows each and every person's abilities and he will not place more upon a person than they can be able to stand or bear. And he's also going to make a way of escape. Now I think about that kind of challenge put before us. Listen to Proverbs 24 verse 10. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. I remember and I hate to admit this, being probably in the 7th or 8th grade, and we had our May Day games, and you'd sign up for a race, and you'd have to run like 10 times around our baseball field. I can remember a whole bunch of us entering that race, and we got about around, and we looked around, and some of them were lapping us already, and we were just like, hey, I'm not going to win this, I quit. We just went over and sat down on the bench and said, you know, I I can't make it. Some people don't realize if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. You didn't prepare well enough. And I'll freely admit I didn't prepare well enough for that. Hebrews 12 verse 4. When you start thinking about us as Christians, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed. You have not gone to the point of having to give up your life for it, striving against sin. Put your effort into it. Part of the message of the book of Hebrews is don't give up, keep on running. Now you think about all the obstacles that the Apostle Paul had to endure to be a Christian, to be an apostle, and to be a preacher. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 23, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes more above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often, and then he begins a series of things he endured. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the Gentiles. In perils of the city. In perils of the wilderness, in perils of the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Paul said, look at what all I've endured But he says, it's important for me to realize why I'm doing this. As long as one is in the race, you cannot stop. You've got to keep fighting. You've got to keep going through every one of these obstacles. The passage from which our lesson text was chosen is Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 32. 
And there the writer says, but recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle of sufferings. Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions with those who were so treated. He said, look back after you became Christians. You see how tough it was? How you endured? You made it through? He said, for you had compassion on me and my chains, joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a an in, better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. He said, you had the right attitude of heart because you knew what was out there and you were fighting against it and you were struggling for it verse 35 therefore do not cast away your confidence which has great reward for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God you may receive the promise what the writer is saying is you need to keep on running Philippians 2, verses, or chapter 3, verses 12 and 14. Not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold on me. And then he tells about you forget the things that are behind, you press forward. You got to keep fighting. And very quickly, let's talk about endurance concludes with a prize. The truth is, we all want to win. The only reason why a person would start in a race or fight in a a battle of some kind is if they expected to win. But when Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 says, for one receives the prize, he wasn't joking. In the ancient games, there was no silver medal or bronze medal. You were the winner or you were losers. And in fact, in some of the games, it ended with the death of the loser. You only have one winner. And the winner lived and the loser died. You see, endurance kept Paul running. It's where he says, okay, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. I love the way you get to 2 Corinthians 4 and he just... He just keeps saying, we got to go, we got to go, we got to keep going. In verse 1, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. We're not giving up. Verse 7 through verse 9, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. Yes, it's tough on every side, but we're keeping on. And then verse 10, he talks about always caring about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus. And he says, we're working toward that. And then finally, verses 16 through 18, therefore we do not lose heart. Though our outward man is perishing, our inward man is being renewed day by day. Yes, I'm getting tired, but my motivation is not waning a bit. And he talks about the prize that is before us. And then where you would expect that I would end with this is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Here's Paul at the end of life and he says, you know what, I have gone through every one of these obstacles. I've held on tenaciously. He says, finally there's laid up for me a crown of life, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me that day, not to me only, but all those who've loved his appearing. God wants each of us to finish and win. When you look at the lives of people throughout the Bible and you start looking at some of them had to face some difficult things, he said, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience, suffering and endurance. 
Verse 11, we count them blessed who endured. You've heard of the perseverance of Job. Oh, yes. A lot of people have faced this challenge, and they have won because they kept on. And I will tell you, it's not always the most talented that finish first. How many times have you seen somebody who was rated number one fall to somebody rated number three or number five or number ten? Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11, I returned and I saw unto the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happens to them all. You know who wins? The person who keeps on, who doesn't give up, who doesn't surrender, who doesn't say it's all over for me. But before you can finish a race, you have to start. And here's where we are this morning. We're at the end of our lesson. And we're talking about people running the Christian race. But if you're not a Christian, you're not running it yet. You say, I'd love to be able to run in the Olympics. You know what you have to do? You'd have to prepare. And then you'd have to try out or qualify. Let me ask you, are you ready to start running the Christian race? Why not begin the Christian race by becoming a child of God this morning? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you willing to repent of your sins? Are you willing to confess his name and be baptized for the remission of your sins? Are you still running the race faithfully? One last verse, Matthew 24, verse 13. But he who endures to the end will be saved. I'd ask, are you saved? If you're not, we're going to sing the song, What Will Your Answer Be? And if you need to come, please come as together we stand and sing. Someday you'll stand at the bar on high. Someday your record will see. song this morning, we'll use the first verse of number 761.
have a good number present this morning. I want to thank each of you for your attendance. And to those of you who are visiting with us, we're glad that you're here and invite you to worship with us at every opportunity that you may have. Thank you, Tony. That was a very good lesson. And uh, we pray that we will all remember those things that we've studied today and apply them to our lives and teach them to others. Our Bible classes begin at 1015 and last until 11 o'clock. I'd like to encourage you to stay for our Bible classes. And then this evening at 6 begins our summer series. And Brother Dan Winkler will be our first guest speaker, and we'd like to encourage all of you to be back at 6 p.m. tonight, and then again Wednesday during our midweek Bible study. And we'll sing this song and be led in our dismissal prayer. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word. together. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful that we've had this opportunity today to come together as a body of your believers and a body of your children, to meet in freedom in this great country, to meet, dear God, on this day, to worship you, to honor you, to serve you, to hear a lesson from your word, dear God, and to commemorate the death, burial, and resurrection of your dear and precious son. We're thankful for Tony and the lesson that he delivered today, reminding us once again of the purpose and desire that we need in our lives, the perseverance, the steadfastness, that we may ever be faithful and true to your cause. Help us to ever be mindful of these words that you leave for us behind, as well, dear God, the examples of the faithful Christians who have walked this life before us. We are indeed grateful for all you do for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>